Joy, peace, tranquility, vibrancy, and wellness. Isn't this what you want instead of constant stress? That's what host Rochelle Lawson is going to help you with on Blissful Living. There are many ways to reduce stress, some you may not even know about. Doesn't a little peace and tranquility sound like just what you've been looking for? Relax for a few minutes with Rochelle. She's the queen of feeling fabulous. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blissful Living. I am Rochelle Lawson, the queen of feeling fabulous, your host, and today we are going to gain some very insightful information with regards to chronic pain and um, how we can utilize some things to help us with that, which is also going to help us reduce or eliminate the stressors from that in our lives. And we'll be talking with my fabulous guest, Dr. Dan Toogood. And Dr. Dan Toogood graduated from UC Santa Barbara and then went on to the Cleveland Chiropractic College. And he began practicing at the International Sports Medicine Institute in West Los Angeles back in 1983. So he's he's been around for a little while. Um, there he treated many athletes that participated in the 1984 Olympics down in Los Angeles. Now, Dr. Too Good has his own practice in Apple Valley, California, and it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dan Too Good to the Blissful Living Show. How are you, Dr. Too Good? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. You are very welcome. So <clears throat> tell us a little bit. I know you've got um you've written several books and um you do a lot of stuff, but can you tell us a little bit? I wanna just let me go back. I wanna mention your book, Chronic Pain Gone in Ninety Days. Chronic pain seems to be a very significant problem that we have here, uh, not just in America, but throughout the world. People are suffering from chronic, chronic pain. And I like the title of your book. Now, has that book been released? Yes, yeah, the book is out now. It's been out for uh, just about a year. It came out at the very end of 2011. And uh, uh, we've been doing, I've been doing radio shows and promoting the book for a year. It's my fourth book. And this one I wrote uh, uh, to be consumed very easily. It's an easy-to-read book. It gets right to the point. The title is Chronic Pain Gone 90 Days, which for some people sounds like an oxymoron, you know, it's because chronic pain by definition doesn't go away. Right. But but uh, it's like flat abs in three days, right? You can hardly believe it. But um, <laughs> but the problem with conventional medicine is, well, first of all, conventional medicine is ineffective in, in eliminating chronic pain, and that's why it's called chronic and so in order to solve these problems you have to take a different approach and I was led into a different approach quite by accident back in 1985 and uh, I, I'm a trained chiropractor and uh -huh. in, in, in chiropractic care we treat mainly neck pain back pain and headaches and uh, joint pain muscle pain etc and lots of sports injuries and the assumption is that if you have physical pain, it's caused by physical stress. You bent, you lifted, you twisted, you had an ox accident, you worked too hard, et cetera, et cetera. But I started noticing back in, as soon as I started practicing back in 82, that many people had problems that didn't really have a, a, a physical event that set it off. They just kind of started having pain. And, and you only know that, for example, headaches, headaches are not due to bonking your head. They're due to something else. So I really had no idea of which direction to go until an, a, a patient came in and told me a story that I didn't believe and I started checking out his story and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a writer but I had to start writing books because I found out what he told me was true and it's not common knowledge so I've been writing ever since and, and I think uh, your listeners 47% of which, by the way, according to the Huffington Post, suffer with some form of chronic pain. So right. uh, this information uh, will lead them on a different path uh, than, than what they've uh, received from conventional medicine. Well, you know, um, you know, with our society, headaches tend to be a really common thing. And I'm sure you see, a, you know, people coming to you a lot um, in your practice with that. You know, they they range from I'm going to say tension headaches to, you know, migraines to cluster headaches and things of that nature. But can you tell us, do you think, or can you give us a, your thoughts on, do you think that these are precipitated by uh, pre-genetic disposed conditions or is it precipitated from just the stresses that we have to deal with in our lives now? 
both answers are correct. It's the accumulation of everything. But what I say uh, in my books and in my talks is that the most powerful effect on our health is what we eat, what we swallow, which is our foods, uh, food additives, supplements, and medications. But then I take that back and I say, wait a second, that it's the second most powerful effect on our condition. The first is our genetic makeup. You know, we all know people who smoke and drink and have bad diets, and they live to be 100. Mm -hmm. and, and so those people were lucky. They got a good genetic base. But most of us are susceptible to many of the bad things that are in our diets, in the medications, and in, in our environment. And so we have to be aware of them so that we can control our internal environment and control our symptoms. So if you were born with a, a good genetic base, you know, like a lot of people say, you know, the first book I wrote was called No Milk mm -hmm. because there, there is a protein in cow's milk that causes most cases of chronic pain, most cases. And a lot of people say, well, I drink milk and I have no problems. It's, right, it's an allergen. That is, some people react to it and some people don't. So everybody's different, but what I have found is there are general causes for most cases of chronic pain that are true for everybody. And, and once people start seeing that, then, uh, you know, they'll understand what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. So, um, I, and I tend to agree with you. I, I mean, I do see a lot of that, you know, with regards to people having allergies that they don't know about. And, and I'm laughing when you said that, you know, you have the people that, you know, smoke, drink, and eat all the bad foods and live to be 100 because my father-in-law was one of those. <laughs> yep, they're around. And here my mother-in-law was trying to eat the right things and be as healthy as possible. And, you know, and, um, you know, lo and behold, uh, bless their hearts, my father-in-law, you know, he he lived um, a long time, well up into his, you know, upper 90s and, um it was just kind of a fluke that he passed away because he definitely wasn't intending to pass away. And then my mother-in-law went shortly after him, and it's like, you know, Harry was doing all this, you know, all this stuff that they tell you not to do, eating the bad food, smoking, drinking, whatever. And my mother-in-law on the other opposite end of the spectrum is doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing. And she really didn't, she didn't live longer than he did because she was like, 13 or 15 years younger than him and she died two years after him so it was it's it's just it's amazing how um you know we may be pre-genetically disposed or not disposed to something but you definitely can take uh corrective action steps in your life to help things you know absolutely and, and the problem with uh uh, some people like your mother-in-law who minded her P's and Q's, uh, you know, diet advice is so conflicting anymore. Yes. You know, what is the right thing to do? And there's so much information out there and so much of it is conflicting and, and sometimes you wonder, what do you do? And a lot of people, uh, they're vegetarians or they're vegans or they eat only organic food, et cetera, et cetera. And they can be doing a lot of things right, but they may be doing one or two things wrong, two, one or two specific things. And if they are doing those things, then they end up with health issues. And uh, a lot of people uh, are, you know, they resign themselves and say, well, I guess it's not my diet because I'm eating really healthy and I'm still having health issues. But once they know specifically what to look for in the diet, then they, they, can, uh, they can actually change their health. And, and that's what my book is about. It happens to be about chronic pain because that's what I deal with. And I'm hoping that motivates people more than just being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You know, if you say, well, if you eat uh, this particular way, you're going to live 10 years longer than everybody else. Well, that's not really a motivating factor for most people. Right. But if you tell people, you know that sharp pain you get in your head every other day? <laughs> well, if you eliminate this specific thing, that pain will go away. People are more motivated by that, I think. And so chronic pain being a, a real popular condition, and it doesn't matter what you call it. You know, there's, there's lots of diagnoses. There's fibromyalgia, right. rheumatoid arthritis, migraines, cluster headaches, psoriasis, eczema, irritable bowel syndrome. You know, every system is affected by these chronic disorders that, quite frankly, doctors don't have the answers for. Right. And the reason they don't have the answers is if you've suffered with chronic conditions and you go to doctors, they'll do lots of testing, they'll try different medications, they may even try surgery, but the one thing that's missing is they never will ask you what you're eating and make a suggestion about it. You know, a lot of people come in and, and with all kinds of health issues, and I'll say, did your doctors ever talk to you about your diet? And they say, yes, they did. What did they say? Well, you know, um, eat healthy. Uh, you know, don't, I said, what does that mean? 
Uh, they say, watch what you eat. Well, what does that mean? They go, well, you know, they don't really know. They don't have a specific uh, 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 instruction on what to eat and what not to eat. And when people realize that that's what's affecting your health, your skin, your digestive system, your aches and pains, then, you know, they'll be motivated when they find out specifically what's causing their problems. Oh, that uh, nice, very nicely summed up. I, I like how you say, and it's true, people are not motivated by, you know, you need to change your diet. You know, okay, well, you know, I eat more fruit. Well, okay, but you still, I want to, you know, say are fat. You're still overweight. You still don't have health. You know, you don't know, you're not healthy. But when there's a crisis or something, or they just won't change their diet. They're like, oh, I'm not going to give up my my morning donut and coffee or, you know, whatever the case. I'm not going to give up my McDonald's or whatever the case may be. Until there's something that they can totally relate to with regards to a pain issue. So you say, okay, well, you know, you if you give up that coffee or you give up that coffee and donut, you're not going to have that pain in your gut that you've been experiencing. Oh, really? And then, and then the next step after that is convincing them that it's true. And so what I've tried to do in my book, and like I said, I've written four books, and, and this is the, 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 the information that I'm sharing in this book is not theoretical. It's observational. It's what I have seen in practice, you know, and so it's not, it's not debatable. It's not like, well, maybe this is true. It is true because I've seen it over and over and over again, and that's that's kind of the test, you know. If you if you have a theory, say, well, you know what? If you supplement vitamin C and this and that, then then you will have a better digestive system, more energy, and your skin will clear up. Well, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But I actually have pictures in my book. You know, when you have all all pain is caused by inflammation. And if you have inflammation, you have pain somewhere in your body. The inflammation can be in your joints, your muscles, your nerves, your cardiovascular system, your skin, etc. And when you have inflammation, you have pain. Now, if the inflammation is in the skin, you can actually see the inflammation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, for example, the the pictures I have in my book are of a psoriasis case. Psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune skin disease for which there is no cure. That's Mm -hmm. what the doctors will tell you. And you can see the inflammation because it's right there on the skin. If you have headaches, you can't really see the inflammation in the nervous system. You just describe that you have pain. But if you want to prove it, like I wanted to do in my book, I'll show I show case where we show the before, during, and after pictures of a psoriasis case that totally cleared up from one specific diet change. And once you see that and realize that you can eliminate inflammation by eliminating the cause of the inflammation, then you can cure uh, almost any disease. And it sounds like miraculous stuff, but it's really quite simple. The approach in my book is, is really, really simple, and, and here's what it is. If you take, if you have pain, any kind of pain, The conventional approach is to take an anti-inflammatory because everybody has realized now, doctors and patients, it's real popular now to talk about inflammation. Inflammation is what causes pain. So if you take an anti-inflammatory pill like an Aleve or Advil or aspirin or Tylenol or any of those uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they're called, then the, the, the systemic inflammation in your body is lowered. And everybody runs either hot or cold, depending on how much inflammation they have. If they're hot, they're running a lot of inflammation, they have a lot of aches and pains, a lot of skin problems, digestive upset, etc. Uh-huh. So when you take an, an anti-inflammatory pill, it doesn't go right to your headache or right to your back. It goes into your system and lowers the level of inflammation. But what people don't realize is that there are certain specific substances in foods, food additives, medications, and supplements that are pro-inflammatory. That is, they're like taking the opposite of an Aleve. It's like putting this thing in your mouth that's going to cause you to have inflammation, and then you have headaches or back pain or whatever it is. So. What I've done in my experience over the years of finally focusing on what people are putting in their bodies is I found out what these specific substances are, and there's only a handful of them that cause almost all cases of chronic pain, and that's what the book is about. It's about eliminating specific pro-inflammatory substances that are causing your pain. I figured it out for you, and so that's what the book is about. So can you tell us about some of those substances, possibly, um that that you know may be causing this I want to say rebound effect with regards to uh, inflammation and pain. 
Sure. There, uh, like I said, there's only a handful. And, uh, you know, if you read a, uh, which hopefully after you read the book and hear this interview, that you will be more, your listeners will be more vigilant about reading labels on, on foods in the stores. Uh, you know, there's an ingredients list on, on every packaged processed food. And it, just so your listeners know, when it says ingredients, there will be a list of substances, and the very first one on the list is, is there's, that's the most what's in the, the, the thing, usually water or sugar or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then second place, third place, fourth place, all the way down until the very last items, there's very little of it. So that's how it's listed. I listed the chapters in my book the same way. There's ten in the very beginning of the book, and if you read the book, you will get the answers within just a very few pages. You'll know exactly what you have to do, and it's the list of ingredients that cause most cases of chronic pain. And again, the number one chapter, well, the first chapter, the most important things to do is, is the chapter is called Do It Now. You know, You've seen those fabulous Bowflex machines uh, that, that people sell, you know, for getting in shape. Mm-hmm. You know what? They don't work. You know, joining the gym, that doesn't work. You know, you, if you join the gym, that does nothing for you. You have to go down there and get on their equipment and, and do the exercises. You have to do the work. The Bowflex machine, you have to do the work. You have to get on the machine and do the work. The machine's not going to do it for you. So what my first chapter is is do it now. You can read my book and find it very interesting and realize that it's nothing you've ever heard before, but that's not going to do you a bit of good. You have to follow the instructions in the book. So the so, first chapter is do it now. Okay, so can you, but back to can you tell us about some of the substances? Right, so that's what we're getting to now. So yeah. the first chapter is do it now. The second one is the first, the most common cause of most cases of chronic pain. And it doesn't matter whether it's in your skin, your back, your head, uh, fibromyalgia, whatever you want to call it, most, and that means more than 50% of cases of chronic pain are caused by one particular protein, and it's called casein, C-A-S-E-I-N. It's the main protein found in cow's milk and dairy foods, or any animal milk, actually, and dairy foods, which, as you only know, is one of the standard pillars of the standard American diet and the cause of standard American health, which is not that good. So milk and dairy foods cause most cases of chronic pain. The reason I say the word casein, is because some milk and dairy foods don't have any casein in it, and mm-hmm. so they won't be inflammatory. And some non-dairy foods that are called non-dairy foods have casein. For example, milk, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, cottage cheese, ranch dressing, blue cheese, all the things made from cow's milk are all have casein in them, and they cause an inflammatory reaction in people who are sensitive to it, which is most people with chronic pain. Now, Butter is a, is a dairy food, but it's only milk fat. It has absolutely no protein in it. So you can eat butter, even though it's a dairy food, and it's not going to cause the pro-inflammatory reaction. Now, on the other side of the coin, uh, you'll, uh, very popular now are non-dairy coffee creamers like Cremora or Coffee Mate right. or Hazelnut or French Vanilla, all of those flavored, foo-foo, powdered, artificial supposedly non-dairy coffee creamers. All of them contain a substance, which is the second or third ingredient, which means a lot of it in there, called sodium caseinate. It's the word casein again, C-A-S-E-I-N with A-T-E on the end of it. That will also cause the inflammatory reaction. So most cases of chronic pain will be eliminated by eliminating casein in all milk and dairy foods, and caseinate in supposedly non-dairy foods, like Cool Whip is one. It mm-hmm. contains sodium caseinate. Now, I'll pause for just a second in a minute, but first I have to say this. Based on my observations, this is true what I just said, and also everybody who reacts to casein and caseinate also reacts to chocolate, only the reaction is worse. Chocolate is the most powerful cause of pain. So when we look at chronic pain, whether it's fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic back aches, migraines, whatever kind of headache, the, the most common cause are those three things, casein in dairy foods, casein in non-dairy foods, and chocolate, dark, light, white, all kinds of chocolate, even chocolate flavoring. So, oh, so okay. So let me just say, okay, you just you touched a sore spot. I'm sure for many people with regards to mentioning chocolate, Absolutely. and you know how there's all this stuff out there about you know the darker the chocolate, the higher the cocoa uh, percentages in the chocolate, the better it is, the more antioxidants 
it has for you. Right. It's supposed to be really good. So right. now you just squash the, you know, I'm sure there's chocolate lovers out there with this this bubble of, oh, you're going to take away my chocolate? Right, absolutely. Tell, people, us, people, tell us about that. Okay, well, uh, uh, first of all, I don't know what the connection is. You know, basically what I do know is what I just said, and that's my observation, that every patient who reacts to dairy foods, casein and caseinate, with some sort of pain or inflammatory reaction, all of them consistently react to chocolate, only the reaction is worse, especially the last few weeks over the holidays. I see a lot of patients coming in because they've consumed chocolate and they have the reaction. Now, the, the nutritional information out there is quite the opposite. You know, people say, well, wait a second, dark chocolate, is good for me, the doctors say. What nutritionists have become is they analyze food for what the ingredients are, like whether they have antioxidants, whether they have vitamins or minerals or that kind of thing, and based on the ingredients say that it's good for you. But, you know, I'm doing the same thing, saying that this ingredient, casein, is not good for you. My information is based on observations, and what I would say to patients is, you can only find out if this is true or not by doing my first chapter, which is doing it. So what you do is you eliminate all dairy foods and chocolate, and you do it for 90 days. That's why the book is called Chronic Pain Gone 90 Days. Mm -hmm. And you will see what you see. If you see a recovery of your symptoms, then there you go. Now, the flip, you know, if you want to actually prove it, then what you do after you're feeling good and you don't have whatever your chronic issue is, have a piece of chocolate. That's all it takes is one piece. And once you see the reaction once or twice or several times, you will know what I have seen. And you'll say, wow, even though the, the, the data and the research says that chocolate is good for you, I know now that when I eat it, I get a headache or I get upset or I get a rash or whatever your reaction is. Once, once you've seen that a few times, then it doesn't matter what the research shows. Only one research study matters, and that's yours. So that's what I've done for 30 years now is watch reactions and find out what's causing it and what's not. And I can tell you I'm a chocoholic. I consume <laughs> no chocolate anymore. But I can tell you this, you know, you, you, a lot of people tell me they can't live without chocolate. Mm -hmm. But once you're off of it for a, a long enough period of time, usually several weeks, I don't care about chocolate anymore at all. You could open a candy bar in front of me and let me smell it. It wouldn't bother me at all. But I'm afraid, though, if I took a bite of it, I would take everything you had. Right. So I right. just stay away from the chocolate. You know, that's interesting because I did this I did this a couple of years ago with regards to sugar. I, I love sweets. I've always been a, a sweetaholic, so to speak. Doesn't matter, candy, cookies, cakes. The the richer the dessert, the better. The more I wanted to eat it. So I said, this is just getting way out of hand. Now I'm fit, I'm healthy. I you know I work out. I don't have any chronic pain or problems. You know I'm I'm just this healthy, fit, fabulous gal. But I realized, you know, this is just getting way. What am I doing to my blood sugar levels? You know, and all this. So I decided at the Lenten time, Lenten season, that I was going to give up sugar. And it was amazing because, of course, the first three days was a little bit challenging, but I was, you know, I'm one of these type of people, people that I'm just going to stick with it and see it through. And got past the three days and went on and, and really lost the craving for the sugar. Um, and then it got to a point where I didn't even want it. I mean, people could eat it around me. It didn't bother me or whatever. The funny thing is, lo and behold, when um, Easter came, um, I had... I was planning to be out of the country with my family on a, um, you know, vacation. So I went to seize candy and bought me two boxes of candy because, you know, Easter time we're going to be in Aruba and I'm going to be able to indulge in this, you know, all these sweets. Got to Aruba, opened up the box of candy, had one piece and didn't even, I mean, I ate the piece. It was nice, but I didn't even have the urge or the desire to eat anymore. And what ended up happening in my family, they're not candy eaters. So what ended up happening is I had these boxes of candy that I ended up leaving for the housekeeper because I just didn't want it. I just didn't, the craving and the desire I had before I went on the sugar fast, so to speak, after the sugar fast, I did not want it. And it was just amazing to me to say, oh, my God, you know, I would be shoveling this chocolate in myself and now before, and now I don't even want that, which I thought I loved so much. And so, and so when, are, you, are you still mainly off of sweets now? Yeah, I mean, every now and then, I mean, I have like, you know, over the holiday season, I had this little bit of a, you know, um, little bit more susceptibility to it, so mm -hmm. to speak, you know, but mm -hmm. still it was really, um, I don't know if it was guarded or whatever, but I would, you know, eat something, but then instead of having the, you know, wanting to just 
indulge in the whole pie or cake, I didn't want it. I mean, I was satisfied with the little bit that I had and that was it. And before that would have never happened. And so I think it's just, you know, and I've continued this, you know, over the years and, and now it's so funny because people that knew me, that knew I was a candy holic or sweet holic, when they don't see me eating the sweets or they're eating all the stuff around me and I'm not like, give me a bite or give me some, they're like, okay, what's going on with you? And I'm like, I, I, I've i lost the craving for it. I mean, I know it's yummy and all that, but I just don't desire to have it like I did before. Well, that, that's my observation, too, in practice and with myself, and I mention it in the book and I talk about it. You know, the, the, when you change your diet, you know, what's going to happen to you? Well, I've seen it many, many times, and so I talk about the chain of events that happens. But craving, we talk about craving in the books. Craving is because the mechanism is called allergy, but technically correct, it's called allergy addiction. Usually what you're allergic to, you're also addicted to okay. because when you cut it out, whether it's alcohol, drugs, medication, dairy foods, chocolate, whatever your little addiction is, if it's chemical, when you cut that substance out, you're probably going to go through withdrawal. Your body is going to feel lousy for classically three or four days, but mm-hmm. usually up to a week and sometimes two weeks. And then, you're, uh, then you recover from that and your craving actually goes away. You're out of withdrawal and you don't crave the substance anymore. And so you totally change your diet. And many, many people who, uh, especially men who are big milk drinkers, who really had a hard time getting off the milk, they told me of the same experience. They stayed off of it for 90 days. They got better. They felt great. Then when they went to have a glass of milk, they didn't even like it. They didn't even want it. So their their taste uh, changed and their addiction changed. So it's just a matter of controlling what you put in your body and getting the desired result. Oh, yeah. I, I really I really like that. I really like how you said that because it's it, it's true, you guys. If you if you don't try it, you never get to experience it. And of course, when you when you stop doing something that you've been doing for a long time, you do go through that withdrawal period. I don't care what it is, whether it's you're addicted to exercise or shopping or whatever the case may be, you do go through the withdrawal period. But then once you get past that, it's amazing how your body talks to you and really says, you know, I really don't want that anymore. I really don't have a desire for that. Yeah, that looks good, but I really don't have a desire for it. And it really changes your mindset. Of course, you have to have a little bit of willpower, uh, Mm -hmm. but that is difficult because what happens is there is a phenomenon which is the craving. Yes. And when, when you cut out a substance, like take, for example, we've all seen it portrayed on TV of like a heroin addict. Mm-hmm. So the heroin addict, when he is incarcerated or they take him off of heroin or he decides to quit, he has, you know, the, the withdrawal symptoms. Mm-hmm. He gets he gets the, the shakes and, and hallucinates and has all these horrible things. Well, that's withdrawal. Now, your body inside knows that there's only two ways out of withdrawal. Number one, you can ride it out and it'll be miserable for a period of time, a week or two weeks, or you can take a fix of whatever your addiction is and the withdrawal symptoms will go away immediately. So the body knows that. So the body says, let's take the shortcut, dude. Let's crave heroin or chocolate or coffee or whatever it is you've quit. You get that craving for it, that intense craving. And a lot of people have argued over the years that that craving means your body needs it. Well, you know, a, a heroin addict, doesn't. his body does not need heroin. <laughs> he, he only has it because of withdrawal. Once the withdrawal goes away and the cravings go away, then you can control how you feel after that. But the name of the game is getting through the withdrawal, which can be difficult. Yes, 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 yes. Now, you know, there's a lot of can – you, can you touch a little bit upon um, – you know, there's a lot of uh, – I don't want to say hype, but a lot of um, – brought to the forefront, I guess might be the word, with regards to, um, you know, gluten. You know, everybody's jumping on the gluten, gluten-free gluten bandwagon. And I know as a registered nurse that, you know, gluten, people that have gluten, you know, we're the people that have the celiac disease and all that. But um, I have seen some people that have not, that do not have the celiac disease and have um, seen them before. And they kind of have this look of, I want to say they were inflamed. It, it, it's it, more like a bloated type of look. Now, they're healthy, fit type of people, but they just have this bloated type of look. And I'm noticing it a lot with, um, I'm, a, I'm a sports fan, and I notice it, I've been noticing it a lot with my basketball players, not my basketball players, but basketball players that, you know, I used to follow back in the day, and now they're no mm-hmm. longer playing. And one person in particular I noticed is Mark Jackson. 
who's the coach of the Golden State Warriors. Now, when Mark Jackson was playing, you know, he was fit and, you know, all that. And I'm sure, you know, eating the right foods based on, you know, the trainer and nutritionist and all that stuff they have for the professional athletes. But he's not playing anymore. He's been retired for a while. Now, he still looks like a very fit dude. He is not, you know, I wouldn't say by any means overweight. You know, he's handsome and all that. But when I see him, he has this, kind of like bloated look about himself. The puffiness. The puffiness. Yes, yes. Yeah, I see it with everybody. You look at Michael Cooper who played for the Lakers, yes, the skinniest guy in the league. Yes. Look at him now. He's got the round puffy face. Yes. Look at Magic Johnson. Of course, he's had uh, medication issues, but all of them have that happen to him. And, uh, but, but, you know, going back to the gluten, whether the gluten is an issue or not, I, I sort of appreciate that gluten is really popular now. It's amazing to me because gluten is on my list, but it's down the list a little ways. It's not as common as dairy and chocolate and, and a couple other things that I'm going to mention in a minute. But it's amazing that it's so faddish now that a lot of people are talking about it. And most people who are talking about it don't even know what it is. It's, it's, the, it's a protein like casein is in dairy foods, but gluten is the main protein in wheat and wheat flour, which is all in all bread, pasta, cakes, cookies, crackers, all that stuff. And while it is a pro-inflammatory substance for some people, when we talk Talk about chronic pain, 50 to 75 percent, it's milk and dairy foods and chocolate and one more that I'm going to mention, but only 10 or 15 percent of the people I see, maybe even less than that, have a sensitivity to gluten. But it is something that has to be considered in some cases. I, I had a few cases where people didn't believe me because I convinced them to get off of dairy foods and they did it for months and years and they didn't see any improvement in their condition. And so most of the time, if they don't see that, then they think the diet is not related. But I've had some patients come back in desperation and say, well, my doctors aren't getting anywhere with me. What should I do? And I say, well, then you add these, th these things to your list of things to avoid, which is dairy foods, chocolate, and the next one is MSG, which is a chemical flavor enhancer found in processed foods, mm -hmm. aspartame, which is, in, uh, which is NutraSweet and it's in all diet sodas and chewing gums. And then the next one on the list is gluten. So you can see gluten is down there at, at number five. And, and I've had many patients who that was the main trigger of their problems and they had to get off of that. But the question a lot of people ask is, you know, well, I can understand dairy foods being a problem because logically you say, well, that's cow's milk. Cow's milk is specifically designed to be the perfect nutrient for baby cows, right? Mm -hmm. So if you put it in a human, it could cause problems. But gluten and wheat, that's the staff of life. But gluten changed a lot over the years, especially in 1950 when uh, the World Health Organization uh, had a problem in Africa. A lot of people were starving. So they wanted the scientists to develop a food stuff that would be drought resistant, grow in Africa, and feed a lot of people. They figured wheat was the one to go with, but they wanted to change it. So most of the scientists were crossbreeding and hybridizing mm -hmm. and, and taking a long time. But Norman Borlaug was his name, who won the Nobel Prize for it. He found a shortcut. And what he did is he took a bunch of wheat seeds and he exposed them to radiation, which was alpha and gamma rays, mm -hmm. creating mutations. Now, most mutations are bad, but he was able to develop a couple of them that were drought resistant, produced a lot of wheat, etc. But they were a mutation from what the naturally occurring wheat germ is. So a lot of our wheat is based on that today, and that's why uh, gluten intolerance has gone up like 400 times uh, oh. since the 1950s, and that's the main reason why. It is something that should be considered, and like it said, it is on my list, but and, and the, the gist of my book is this. It's chronic pain gone 90 days. I list the substances in order of which are the most common. Now, most people who suffer with chronic pain, like I said, if they just eliminate all dairy foods, caseinate and non-dairy foods and chocolate, they will recover. And they'll find out they don't react to wheat. They don't react to a lot of other things. Right. You know, and I don't want to be onerous and tell people, you know, you got to give up all this stuff. So the gist of my book is do if you suffer with chronic pain and you're not responding and you're desperate, then what you do is you follow the whole list for 90 days. You eliminate all dairy foods, all chocolate, all caseinate, all gluten, all MSG, aspartame, and medications. When you recover, then you will find out that there's only one or two things that really bother you, and most people find that their sensitivity to those things decreases over 90 days. That is, when they used to drink a glass of milk or have a piece of cheese and get a headache or a backache every time they had it, they get to the point where if once in a great while they have some, they're able to get away with it.
But if they get back into regular use again, they're going to feed the inflammation. And like you said in the very beginning, the right. effect is cumulative, and boom, you start having problems. Wow. I it just it, just amazing. You know, you you mentioned um, MSG on, on your list there, and I uh, particularly have a sensitivity to that. First of all, I'm lactose intolerant, so I don't really – I don't drink milk. I mean, I don't do a lot of milk dairy products, and it took me – Mm, a long time, the majority of my years, I just found out I was lactose intolerant probably, well, how old is my daughter, probably nine years ago, but I suffered from a problem since I was a kid and no one could ever figure it out. Um, long story short, but um, the MSG I discovered I was really sensitive to. And I couldn't, I was, you know, go eat something, you know, and immediately, and I couldn't figure out what the, what it was. I felt good, and but immediately I would get this feeling after I ate whatever it was that contained the MSG um, that I needed to throw up. And I would throw up. I would just throw up what I ate. It wasn't like bulimic type of thing. It was like my body was rejecting the food that I ate because it had the MSG. And I started putting it together because I'm like, this has happened, and I don't feel bad, but why am I throwing this food up that I thought was so yummy, you know? And and I realized, oh, my gosh, it's this sensitivity. I, I started, you know, putting two and two together. And how I well, – I think what was a clinker for me was I went and got a Togo sandwich. And I'm not really a fast food type of person, but I went and got a Togo sandwich. And, um, you know, they put different things on the, the produce uh, to preserve it, and there's MSG in the meat and all that. And I, I ate this Togo sandwich, and I was, like, immediately threw up. And I'm like, okay, I think there's something – in the food, you know, think there's some kind of preservative. Yeah. And I went back in and asked the guy, and he starts naming some stuff, and the main thing was MSG. And then I started paying attention to previous times when I would have something and I had this urge to throw it up. And I was like, I bet it contained. And so now I'm to the point I am so sensitive to it. You know, I know what it is. I know, you know, where it's at. I can I can almost immediately taste it the moment I eat it. Um you know that, but it got a, by me being sensitive to it. I guess what I'm saying is, I'm aware of it. I stay away from it, and it doesn't cause me any problems. But it took me a while to figure to put the you know put the puzzles together, uh, put the pieces to the puzzle together to figure out that it was the MSG that was causing me um, these different. Yeah, I, I, I think your listeners and all people should be aware of what MSG, where it is, and, and what it can do to you. I I started seeing it back in in uh, the late '80s. And uh, there's a book. There was a book out at the time called "In Bad Taste: The MSG Syndrome," and it was by a doctor, George Schwartz. And there are several others. I finally wrote a little book about it uh, back in 1997 called "MSG Is Everywhere," and that's because MSG is everywhere. And most people have heard of it, but they don't really know what it is or where it is. It's. And I'll give you just a little a little rundown on it. It's not a preservative. It's a flavor enhancer. Mm -hmm. What it does is when it goes in your mouth, it irritates the taste buds, which your nerve endings on your tongue and then that consequently sends a stronger signal of taste to your brain for whatever is in the food that you're eating if you if you taste MSG by itself uh, they sell it in the stores it's called MSG or accent accent, accent is pure MSG you taste it, there's not much taste to it. But when it's in with the food, it irritates the taste buds, and if the food is salty, it tastes saltier. If it's beefy, it tastes beefier. It's an amplifier. Mm -hmm. The problem is then it gets into your bloodstream, and once it gets into your bloodstream, it still works as a nerve irritant and can cause the most common symptoms are panic attacks, mood changes, heart palpitations, headaches, back pain. Uh, it looks like a heart attack in many cases, and a weird symptom that I've seen for many years is little bruises that are about the size of a dime that pop up on your body for no apparent reason. The stuff should be illegal, uh, but it's it's out there, and the labeling is misleading. A lot of products will say, uh, here's something you'll see a lot. It says, no MSG added. Right. When, when you see that on a label in a restaurant, there's MSG in that product. They just didn't add any themselves. It's in an ingredient that's already in the package. The only ones you can trust are ones that say no MSG, period. And many times, another label that you'll see, they'll say no MSG, and it'll have a little asterisk after the MSG. 
And whenever you see that, there's MSG in there, and they're about to explain it in some really small print that you can barely <laughs> see on the package. And, and it'll say, and it always says the same thing, it said, except for that which is naturally occurring in yeast extract and autolyzed yeast. Uh, my book contains the AKAs or the names that they hide MSG under because they call it lots of things like hydrolyzed right. protein, natural flavors, flavorings, yeast extract, right. autolyzed yeast, etc. It's it's in a lot of foods. So a lot of my patients, I you know, they say, well, you gave me all these names, and I'm in the grocery store for four hours trying to figure <laughs> out what what has MSG and what doesn't, and I understand their plight. And so I tell them, I said, well, do, we, do you want the shortcut? And they said, yeah, what's the shortcut? I said, if it has a label on it, don't buy it. And they go, well, what am I going to get? <laughs> well, we'll think about it. You're going to get produce. There's right. no labels on a banana or an apple or a head of lettuce, any of that stuff, because it's all just a pure natural food. Right. You can get eggs. You can get uh, any meat at the, at the butcher counter that's a pure meat, like mm-hmm. steak, hamburger, chicken, fish, turkey, pork. That's all okay. But you want to stay away from processed meats, like at the deli counter, that are salami, bologna, pastrami. All of those meats that have been taken apart, chemicalized, and put back together again, most of them contain some uh, some amount of MSG. And let me say one more thing about MSG. When we look at the dairy protein casein that we talked about as being the number one cause of pain, that substance is an allergen, which means it doesn't matter how much you get. If you get a little bit of the milk protein, like some, a splash of milk on your cereal or some cream in your coffee, that'll elevate the level of inflammation in your body for three or four or five days from the one dose. So in order to eliminate the allergen, like talk, like uh, uh, MSG, I mean like uh, dairy foods and chocolate mm-hmm. and gluten, you have to eliminate it 100%. MSG is different. It's a toxic substance like alcohol, which means it's dose dependent. If you took a sip of alcohol, you might not notice anything. But if you had two or three drinks, you would definitely notice the effect. And if you had enough of it, it would kill you. The same thing is true of MSG. A small dose you may not notice. And a lot of food manufacturers say, well, we only put a little bit so it's not going to harm you. But like we talked about at the the outset, some people are more sensitive than others. So you sound like you're very sensitive. Um, I'm personally not very sensitive, although I do my best to avoid it. So... MSG, which stands for monosodium glutamate, should be avoided um, by everyone, I think. But at least, you, you know, the manufacturer should let you know if there's some in their food. Uh, I, you, you know, you, this is a fabulous information. I mean, I know the listeners probably thought we were going to really specifically talk about, you know, eliminating chronic pain or whatever, which we're doing. But you guys, I want you to, I want you to, to bone in or hone in onto what Dr. Tugut is saying with regards to. He's giving you some diehard, very specific information that not only is going to help you with how you eat and all that, but it's also going to help you eliminate the chronic pain that you may be experiencing. So we're doing a twofold, we're giving you a two for one here. Um, I could say the most important thing that one of the things that he's saying is pay attention to the labels. And I always tell my clients as well, you know, you want to eat the freshest foods possible. You know, go to the produce section, look at the produce. Everything is vibrant, it's fresh, it's yummy, there's no labels. You know what you're getting when you pick up that sweet potato or you, that onion or whatever. You know what you're getting for the most part. Go to the frozen food section. Okay, you got labels, you know, okay, it's, you know, not as pretty because you can't really see it. But, you know, it's frozen, so okay, you know. Then go to the canned food section. That food is dead. <laughs> it's been in those cans for years. If you start eating that, and it has a label, okay, you start reading the labels of all the stuff they utilize in that can to preserve that food that's been sitting on the shelf for years, and then you're going to take that can of food and eat it, what do you think you're going to be putting into yourself? You're going to be putting dead stuff into yourself with a bunch of toxic chemicals that's not going to do your body any good. So Dr. Too Good really is giving you some very vital information. It's like you don't want to go to the store and spend four hours like his clients do, you know, when they first start um, trying to follow what he, the advice he's giving to them. And then he says, okay, just go and eat, you know, look at the produce. It's so simple. But um, it does take you it does take for you to take some action steps to, to really make Yeah, you do have to take action, but but there's there's two ways uh, to approach the information that, that I'm sharing with your listeners today. Uh, number one, they should know that the most powerful effect after genetics, which you can't change, but after genetics, the most powerful effect on your health 
is what you're eating, and your doctor is not going to talk about it in specific terms. You know, we all want to have goodies once in a while, and we all want to cheat and, you know, and have something that maybe we shouldn't have, etc. But what I want your listeners to know is there are specific things in the diet that are going to make you miserable, and you need to know about them so that if you do go out to eat and say, I'm going to have a nice dinner in a restaurant, but I know I want to avoid the MSG, so I'm going to look for that. I know I don't want to have anything dairy. I don't want to have anything chocolate. And if you have a sensitivity to gluten, then you say, I'm going to stay away from the bread and the breading. So you have some guidelines, but then there's still lots of other options that you can have. So some people... They may like looking at the information one way, which is tell me what I can't have. And other people say, well, no, tell me what I can have. So it, it, it depends on which, which way you want to approach the information. <laughs> but, you know, what you can have is pure fruits and vegetables, rice and beans and, and pure meats. And, and that's a short list, but that's what we should all eat. You know, but specifically, if you want to go for the goodies, then here's the specific stuff that's in food that you want to make sure you don't get. Never get dairy protein. Never get dairy foods. Never get caseinate which is a form of the dairy protein. Never eat chocolate, and I know that bums a lot of people out. <laughs> but, but, but I can tell you, once you're off of the chocolate and you see the difference in how you feel, you won't miss it at all. And, and uh, you can find other goodies that you can have that, that don't set you off in, in a reaction. So um, it's, it's being specific about the diet. And I think that if, if your listeners aren't people who suffer with chronic pain, I know they know somebody who has chronic pain. Right. And I can tell you that in most cases, the answers to their problems are in this book that I've written. And I wish they would all get it. The name of the book is Chronic Pain Gone, Nine Zero Days. I didn't put the word in in there. I wanted to be cryptic. So it's Chronic Pain Gone, 90 Days. You can get it at Amazon.com. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. You can uh, get it at my webpage, which is uh, the name of the book, which is www.chroniccaingone90days.com. So there's a lot of information. Uh, you can see some interviews I've done there, and there's other books that I've written and other people have written. And so if you can get a hold of that information, follow it, and share what you found with other people and turn them on to it, we can lick this chronic pain problem because conventional medicine is not going to do it. What they've done is gone from aspirin to Vicodin to, mm -hmm. to now Oxycontin, Oxycodone. They're basically giving you forms of heroin because they don't know what causes chronic pain. Once you figure out what causes chronic pain, it's not medication is the answer. It's the subtraction of the specific pro-inflammatory substances that are causing your pain, and that's what the book is about. I like that, and thank you for give, sharing the information with regards to how the listeners can get the book, because I was, I was definitely going to, um, you know, enlighten them, but I like how you touch on the fact that, you know, um, and I love my physicians, don't get me wrong, I love my Western medicine physicians, they're awesome when they need to be, um, you know, I'm, my background is um, in emergency room trauma nursing, um, so I do love them, but I see this huge problem that they've created with regards to addiction and the way they prescribe medications, it's unbelievable, I prescribe a medication for any for everything, for instance, Vicodin. And, you know, Vicodin, we have so many Vicodin addict, addicted people out there. And, you mm -hmm. know, Vicodin, you, you have patients come in asking specifically for Vicodin, Oxycontin, Dilaudid. These are very high, powerful, highly narco you know, addictive narcotic substances, not going to cure a darn thing not going to cure anything. All they're going to do is take care or mask the, sign, the signs and symptoms. But what you're offering in your book is a way for people to really eliminate the chronic pain. Well, eliminate yeah, here, here's, here's the difference in the approach. We definitely need Western medicine. I think that Ew. people should, should go to their doctors and know what their blood tests say and know if their cholesterol is high or mm -hmm. if their blood pressure is high or if uh, there's, a, there's a test that many doctors don't do called uh, CRP with C-reactive protein, which tells you how high a level of inflammation you have in your body. And now once you know that you have a problem or that you have an imbalance, then what I say to do is switch over to my approach instead of their approach. Their approach is if you have a chemical imbalance that causes your cholesterol or your blood pressure or your blood sugar or, or your triglycerides or whatever to be elevated beyond normal, then their solution is to add something. 
My solution is to subtract, right. and that is to find out what are you consuming that's contributing to your problem. And one of the other chapters that I think is very important in my book is about exercise. And uh, what I say about exercise is that a lot of experts say there's a right way to exercise and a wrong way, and I agree with them. The right way is to exercise the way you like. The wrong way is not to exercise at all. Right. So while some would say, well, this swimming is better than biking is better than aerobics, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it doesn't matter what, what the name of the chapter about that is, is move a lot. Mm -hmm. You want to keep your body moving a lot. Eat the right foods, avoid poisonous medications and foods and additives, and you can manage your own health. You go to the, the Western doctors to find out how good a job you're doing, but you don't want to fall into their typical routine of adding medications because then you're going to take other medications to counteract those medications. And if you don't believe that, then just watch primetime TV at night and watch the commercials. And you'll see that most of them are drug commercials, and they're all the same. The first 10 seconds is about how wonderful the drug is, and right. the remainder of the commercial is watch out if you have suicidal tendencies or kill your boss or you know, <laughs> bleed from your eyeballs or uh, have delayed backache or uh, you know, decreased sex drive or whatever. Right. But, you know, all of right. those pills cause side effects, and people should know that. Yeah, and, and Dr. Too Good is right. Now, I'm, I wasn't like, you know, Pull it out the bull whip and, and, and spanking the doctors, but I see it's a, it's a huge problem in our society with over medicating the population. Instead of getting to the heart of the problem and eliminate the problem, they're, they're, they instead want to put a band aid on the problem and give you these pills. And what he right. said, and you know, you take one pill, then you need to take another pill to offset this. Now, I tell people, a hundred people can go on with high blood pressure, quote unquote high blood pressure, they're going to get the same medication. Now, if right. that, that pill doesn't work for you, well, let me add another one and let me right. add another once. And while we're talking while we're talking about medication, I just want to make one comment, and that is that in my book, you know, all medication can cause problems. And one of the problems a lot of them cause is pain or neuropathy or headaches or whatever. But by far, the worst medication on the market today and the ones that are being overused the most are the drugs for cholesterol, okay. which mainly are statin drugs like Simvastatin, Lovastatin, Zocor, Lipitor, Mevacor, Provacol. There's a long list of them. Uh, the, the, the conventional wisdom among medical doctors is that cholesterol is the big bugaboo and that's what's causing all this heart disease and if you even approach high normal you need to be medicated that is a mistake right. especially because these drugs cause many many health problems mm -hmm. the main one of which is different forms of chronic pain usually in the legs leg weakness leg cramps leg numbness but the aches and pains can be anywhere in the body many patients have already made the connection they know that they started hurting immediately after taking those pills but there's a lot of people who are in my opinion, over-medicated and shouldn't be taking those pills right. and are wondering why they have numbness in their feet and why they have why their legs jump at night, et cetera, et cetera. And in many, many cases, it's their cholesterol pills. So they should be aware of that. I thank you for that. Thank you so much because um, – we're, we're touching home on some, you know, some really good information. And listeners out there, you know, if, if you go to your doctor, ask him about the different tests, the, the blood test that Dr. Too Good mentioned. You want to get a baseline. Don't be afraid to, you know, really um, – have a communic communicative process with your physician. A lot of times people go in and the doctor tells them this, that, and that, and they don't have any, they don't ask any questions because they don't want to bother the physician. They don't want to take time. But then they're looking for the nurse to, to explain to them what they should have gotten explained to them from the physician. The physician's the one that you should be communicating with. He's giving you the instructions. If you don't have clarity, then you need to, you know, get clarity from the doctor. Don't be afraid to ask for these specific tests. You know, there, it's information for you. It's not a bother for the physician. All they have to do is put in the computer another another lab test that they want done on the blood that's going to be drawn from you anyways. So don't be afraid to ask for this and get this information and utilize it for yourself because you are your best health advocate. No one's going to do it for you. No one's going to look out for you. When you leave that physician's office, I guarantee he's on to the next patient because he's has, you know, he has a heavy load. So right, and that, that brings up a point I made in yeah. my first book I wrote, and that's when I got into this, is, is one of the things I say is nobody knows the human body better than the owner. Right. And 
And you should realize that when you're in a health care issue with a doctor, us doctors, we are only here for information. We are your partners right. in solving this problem. We're not the controller. We are. We have our information. You have your information. We put it together, and we come up with a solution. So it's both people have to be involved, the doctor and the patient, and that's what's important. So you have to ask the questions, and you have to make your own suggestions, and you have to keep yourself informed so that you can say, well, doc, you know, I heard this interview, and you want me to take lovastatin, but I've heard it can cause problems. What do you know about that? Right. And pick his brain or her brain and, and, and get a solution. Right. Right. I, I, okay, then I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox with that. I, I just, you know, I just see it. I hear it. I experience it, you know, with people. And and then it's like, you know, they try something and then, you know, they just they it, it, just do what Dr. Tugut said. It, it, it will just make things so much more simpler for you and you'll be on the same page. At least you'll be, have some awareness about truly what's going on within yourself when you pay attention to yourself and put your health and well wellness first. So with that, I'm going to say... Thank you so much, Dr. Too Good, for being on our show, our show, me and my many personalities, with being on the show today. Um, I think the listeners have really gotten some really good information, and I think that um, some of them might be a little bit upset that they may have to give up their chocolate, but hey, if you want to feel good and have no pain or less pain, then you do want to follow the suggestions um, that Dr. Too Good has laid upon us today, and you do want to pick up a copy of his book, Chronic Pain Gone in 90 Days, and you can get that. Again, I'm going to mention the website you can get the book. is www.chronicpaingone90days.com. Again, that's www.chronicpaingone90days.com. Now, if they want to get in contact with you, Dr. Too Good, how can they do that? The best way is by email. My email is my name at AOL.com, and that is D R T W O G O O D. My num my name is spelled like uh, two like, like the number two G O O D. So it's Doctor Too Good at AOL.com. I'll answer all emails, and that's the best way to get a hold of me. So I have a funny question to ask you: Is it is are, were you really born? Doc, I mean, of course, you weren't born doctor, but were you really born Dan too good, or is yes? Good? I, I ask, I'm asked that question a lot, and I tell people. I said, if I wanted to make up a name, I would have made Feel Good. <laughs> I would be Dr. Feelgood, but no, actually, that's my name. We've, uh, my family has been in the country since 1690, so we've been around a long time. So yeah, almost any town you go to, you'll find maybe one person who has that name. And is that is that person related to you? Uh, a lot of them are, yes. Most of them are. I've never, ever, I, you know, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, this has got to be a joke. He's just, you know, this is just too good to be for real. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that before. <laughs> Oh, but um, I love it. I love it. It definitely makes people, you know, remember you, right? Right. Yeah, and, you know. Well, I hope they will, and I, and I hope they get a hold of the book. You, you know, Honestly, I've written lots of books, and this one is so to the point and so easy to read, and it has the information that you've never heard before, and it'll tell you exactly how to get rid of whatever form of chronic pain you have. So get the book or get it for your friend or get it for somebody you know who's suffering and is not getting the answers. Okay, you guys, so you heard it. Get it for, if you don't need it for yourself, then get it for someone you love and care about that you know is suffering from chronic pain. Give them the book. Allow that to be their welcome to the 2013 gift um, that's going to help them have a better life. And, and you know, it, it's, it's just going to spread goodness, and they will really appreciate you for giving them this book, okay? So with that, I'm going to say thank you once again, Dr. Too Good, for being a guest on the show. You were absolutely fabulous. Um, anybody out there, if you want to get in contact with Dr. Too Good, pick up the book. You can do that. All the links will be on the website as far as how to access him and get the book. And I'm going to just say thank you all for listening. I really, duly appreciate all of you. You bring so much light um, to me and allow me to uh, pick up your energy to do this show and bring you fabulous guests that shares their, their wonderful information with you. So I'm going to say thank you again for listening to Blissful Living. I'm Rochelle Lawson. Take good care, everyone, and bye for now. You can find out more about Rochelle on her website, Rochelle Lawson, R-O-C-H-E-L-E, Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N, or at healthhealingwellness.com. Or just click on her websites from the webtalkradio.net page right in front of you. And, of course, you'll want to come right back here next week for another episode of Blissful Living. Thanks for joining us.